Hey folks, Dr. Hagmeyer here. One of the common problems seen with people who have digestive problems, bloating, belching, gas, diarrhea, skin conditions, uh, fatigue, rosacea, fibromyalgia, acne, depression, is something known as SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, I have personally worked with hundreds of patients with SIBO, and including myself, have been treated successfully. And the best part about it is we did it naturally. But the purpose of today's video is to share with you some of the common problems and the pitfalls and really share with you my perspective of where I see many people going wrong, making an infection that could be easy to treat, making it very difficult to treat. So there's five major points I wanna discuss with you today. Number one is why many people get reinfected. Many people that are uh, get diagnosed with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth are put on antibiotics, and then within a six to 12 month period of time, the infection's back. And it reminds me a lot of the merry-go-round that happens with kids who receive antibiotics for ear infections. Number two, I wanna talk about why antibiotics are not always the best treatment approach for some people with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Number three, I wanna talk about the different kinds of breath tests that are out there and, and some of the causes and problems behind why testing comes back negative. And while no test, I should say, while no test is perfect, many people get a SIBO test done and they have unknowingly caused a false positive test. So I wanna discuss some of those reasons in terms of why that happens. Finally, I want to share with you what I call the big picture in treating SIBO and why treatment really needs to be tailored and customized to the individual. In other words, don't follow some Joe Schmo's 30 days to eradicating SIBO program that is just littered throughout the internet. Okay, so now for those of you who are just turning in, SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth continues to be one of the most common causes of IBS. It's not the only cause of IBS symptoms, but it's a very common problem that we see over and over with people that have irritable bowel syndrome. So again, those irritable bowel syndrome things are gonna be like uh, abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, gas. SIBO, just as the name implies, is a bacterial infection in the small intestines. And here's the problem. Normally, you shouldn't see the kinds of bacteria in the small intestines that you see in the large intestines. But what happens is with SIBO, the bacteria in the large intestines migrate up into the smaller intestines where they don't belong. And this can happen just for a number of reasons and I've discussed these in other videos, but what happens ultimately is it creates a huge problem that can extend far beyond just bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, and those irritable bowel-like uh, symptoms. If you take a brief look at this illustration, this chart here, you're gonna quickly see that SIBO is often associated with many other conditions, or it could be a contributing cause to these conditions. And this is an important point to understand when considering treatment and why it's important to look at the entire clinical picture, look at the big picture, not just the infection component of the gut, but all the things that can affect the motility and the health of the gastrointestinal tract. This essentially is the who, what, where, when, and of course, the most important question is the why. I want you to consider this. If you've ever gone to the local Home Depot store or hardware store and looked for garden hoses, most of the time, those garden hoses come in 25-foot segments. Well. I want you to imagine all of that hose sitting right here in your abdomen. Within your digestive system, there is a rhythmic, reoccurring, cyclic complex that occurs in the stomach and the small intestines that happens between meals. This cycling complex has also been named the migrating motor complex, or the MMC, or the myoelectric motor complex. Now, this MMC, migrating motor complex, is essential for a number of reasons. Number one, this MMC triggers peristalsis, this is the wave-like contractions that propels the food you eat through the digestive system from the stomach uh, into the intestines. Number two, this migrating motor complex also decreases the bacterial buildup in the beginning parts of the small intestines. And that's really, really important. This is why sometimes if you look at the internet, this is why it's referred to as the cleansing waves. Now, I like to think of it as the street sweepers that come out at night when all the hustle and bustle of eating is over, the cycle of motility occurs between meals or in fasting states, and it's often the grumbling sound that you hear between meals, okay? Uh, this is also the reason why people who have SIBO generally feel better when they don't eat, okay? Remember that when, that when the MMC is the most active, okay, is between meals. Now, if the migrating motor complex shuts down or slows down or is impaired, the street sweepers are not keeping the intestines clean. And what we know is that upwards of 70% of people who have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, experience a disruption of this migrating motor complex. When the second and third phase of that migrating motor complex is reduced, 
bacteria start to uh, stay in the intestines and instead of being pushed forward in the intestines, in the large intestines, they kind of stay there. These bacteria then adhere to the lining, they set up shop, and they disrupt the mechanics of what's going on within the gastrointestinal system. And of course, this can lead to things like food sensitivities, it can lead to things like leaky gut, it can lead to, obviously it can lead to inflammation. Last week I had three patients, all with your typical IBS symptoms of bloating, gas, constipation. But beyond getting tested, uh, beyond the testing that we did for SIBO, we also checked these patients for inflammatory bowel disorders. We checked them for Crohn's, we checked them for ulcerative colitis. And this was uh, detected through antibody testing. And this is why, why it's so important that you work with a doctor who's not only going to just stop at the investigation at SIBO, but also start to look at possibly other mechanisms that are contributing factors to the symptoms that you have. Now, if you're not familiar with a FODMAP diet and the foods you need to avoid, I want you to visit my website and you can download a list of foods to avoid. It's an it's a email that you'll, um, it's a, um, a packet of, of, of information that I put together for you. It's free, all you have to do is put your name and email, but it's gonna give you a lot of dietary recommendations to make eating a FODMAP diet uh, a whole lot easier. Sometimes, depending on the individual, you might need to avoid many things that historically are, have been touted as being good for gut restoration. So in some cases, uh, probiotics, prebiotics, things like kefir, and sometimes even bone broth and fermented foods. Sometimes these foods, um, depending on the extent of your uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, can make things worse. So again, uh, sometimes these foods can create a histamine response. So back to this migrating motor complex. This migrating motor complex can be affected by many things. Remember, we want to focus on motility. And the causes behind why, uh, why motility is compromised, not just killing the infection. So what does SIBO or low MMC activity have to do with thyroid disease or even adrenal problems or even too much estrogen as in the case with girls on oral contraceptives? Well, here's the thing. Women who are in menopause or perimenopause, where women typically tend to favor a more estrogenic state, and that excess estrogen can slow down motility. Hypothyroidism affects the entire gastrointestinal system and also causes hypomotility. Ask any person with thyroid disease, and you're often going to find that the majority of them also suffer with IBS and predominantly the constipation kind. Here's what happens. In, with people who have hypothyroidism, Hypothyroidism slows down gastric emptying. It can also compromise hydrochloric acid production. And if you think about that just for a moment, the importance of hydrochloric acid in the stomach, part of it is not only digesting foods, but the other component of hydrochloric acid is to sterilize the contents of the foods prior to it entering into the small intestines. And so if you don't focus on improving digestion, then these pathogens and these invaders that you just ate can now populate the intestines as well. Low thyroid function also delays gastric emptying and ultimately it slows down the migrating motor complex. So you can see here why optimal thyroid function is critical to addressing SIBO. Now, even if you've been told that your thyroid levels are normal, they're probably not optimal. And so what I would do is I would encourage you to visit my website and look at what represents optimal levels of thyroid function versus what is the statistical norm. Chronic stress can also affect the migrating motor complex and be a contributing factor in the development of SIBO. Now, when you think of stress, think adrenal glands. And if your body is always locked up in this fight or flight response, digestion shuts down because the immediate need is burning fuel for energy. Here again, people who have IBS are chronically and often fatigued. And here's why, because they are in a chronic prolonged state of stress. Physiologically, when your body's under this chronic stress, you produce less saliva, you have less digestive enzymes, you have less stomach acid, and here again, peristaltis slows down. Stress and cortisol fluctuations will inhibit the sweeping motion of that migrating motor complex in between meals, leading to again that bacterial overgrowth. This is one of the reasons why stress levels need to be addressed when addressing uh, any kind of digestive symptom and condition. Again. This is why you need to look at the big picture. Now, on a side note, about four or five years ago, I had tested positive for SIBO. I had treated myself with various antimicrobials, biofilms, I was on all different kinds of enzymes, et cetera, 
And I was unable to really address and get rid of my digestive problems until I began looking at the entire clinical picture. And my own experience with this is why my approach is very different than a lot of doctors that are out there. Without testing myself, I would have never known what was happening in my own body. Um, if you look at this chart, for example, one of the very first things you want to do if you have any of these conditions you see listed here, or if you've been diagnosed with IBS or any other GI disorder, is to work with a doctor you like and get tested. While again, no test is perfect, many doctors will say that you don't need to test for SIBO. I completely disagree here. There can be many instances when a test comes back negative and a person is truly positive. And you better believe that if you follow these things that we're gonna talk about later in the video, you can only increase the likelihood of a positive test, okay? You're gonna see that you can increase, in other words, you can see that the outcome of that test will increase the accuracy. So a lot of people will say that SIBO tests aren't accurate. Well, they're not accurate if you don't follow the preparation for them, okay? Recently, quick story, recently a new patient came to me after getting herself tested for SIBO. The test came back neg negative, but upon questioning uh, on the preparation of the test, she did everything wrong. So we retested her, and of course the test came back positive. So I want to talk to you a little bit about testing. And if you are suspicious of SIBO, I want to talk to you about the, the best test uh, that's currently known, and that's a breath test, okay? Some breath tests detect H. pylori, some tests detect fructose malabsorption, some tests identify lactose intolerance. Either way, the standard testing for SIBO is a breath test. It's not a urine test, it's not a, a blood test. If you're not familiar with these tests, what happens is that a person will drink a solution of either glucose or lactulose, and a sampling of their breath is taken every 15 to 30 minutes. Now, when I run these tests on patients, I always order both the hydrogen and the methane. Very important. Some doctors only run a hydrogen test and then they don't measure the methane. I like to look at both. Again, that's my preference based on my experiences. So how do you prevent a false positive SIBO test and increase the accuracy of that test? Well, there are many potential reasons a person might have a test that says they're negative. So let me give you seven reasons you might not get an accurate test result. You can always go back to my website and learn the others, but these are the most common ones according to the labs that offer these testing. Number one is delayed gastric emptying. Number two, patients with chronic pancreatitis. Number three, patients with celiac disease. Number four, patients that are on antacids or proton pump inhibitors. These are gonna be things that affect the pH of your gut, things like Zantac, Prilosec, Prevacid. Um, if you've been on recently, if you had an infection and you recently were on antibiotics, for whatever reason, that can offset the, the results of your test. Uh, it's very important also that you follow a low FODMAP diet. Uh, some some uh, labs will say 24 to 48, 48 hours. I say four to five days prior to testing is going to only increase your likelihood of a more accurate test. And number seven is, is diarrhea. And that's because obviously diarrhea has a, a faster rapid transit time. So in bringing this video to a close, a couple of points I wanna to stress to you and things I want you to remember. Number one, focus on the big picture. In order to address the root cause behind SIBO, we need to look at other potential contributing factors that compromise the migrating motor complex. Again, these can be things like dysbiosis. They can be things like low stomach acid. They can be things like inflammation. They can be things like thyroid hormone imbalances. These can be things like adrenal stress hormones, synthetic hormones such as those found in birth control pills, a malfunctioning ileocecal valve. Now, we didn't talk too much about this, but I'll do another video on this at a, at a later time. The ileocecal valve is the valve between your colon and your small intestines. And understanding that connection between SIBO is very important as well. So if you don't uh, look at some of these other factors, what's gonna happen is you're gonna bounce from one doctor to the next doctor to the next doctor and you're gonna spend a lot of money and still not get any answers, okay? This is the most important. Number three is, is really, I think, the most critical, and that's be realistic. Depending on what's happening within your body, and that's very important, within your body, you're going to heal differently than any other person who has SIBO. So don't compare yourself to someone else that has SIBO. So again, I hope you found today's, uh, today's video valuable. I hope you have a better understanding of some of the causes uh, and connections that SIBO has with other parts of your body. Uh, if you found it helpful, please share it with people out there that are also suffering. Realize that you can get better. Most importantly, find a doctor who feels 
uh, uh, who understands SIBO and a doctor that you just have a connection with. I think that's really important because understanding that this is a partnership and you got to have a good relationship with your doctor for optimal health. Okay? Till next time, take care.